Okay. I'm, I'm going to now move you to the delivery of instruction, and um, I'm going to make a prediction. How, kid, uh, how we deliver instruction to kids in five years is going to be fundamentally different than it is today. The only thing I'm not sure of is whether it's going to be public schools or not. Mm -hmm. And so I want to take you to why I say that. And I think what we have to decide is what I'm going to share with you in the next several minutes. Whether we bring this inside our schools, this change in <laughs> delivery of instruction, or whether we keep it outside of our schools. If we keep it outside of our schools, I believe we're going to be Uberized. You know, that's a term the taxi companies use. They've been Uberized. So let me take you to why I say it. Um, technology has transformed the lives of these kids. Young children today are totally immersed in a technological world. To show that to you, let me show you a little guy. Um, and, and watch him play with the technology. And it's not going to be a surprise to you, but I want to set the stage with it. Yeah. No, OK, show me your world. I just defined the problem. Um, if my grandmother was alive today, grandma would be 124 years old. She told me a story my first year of teaching. Um, and, and she grew up and lived and taught in northern New York, where I'm uh, from. Uh, up until the Great Depression in New York State, there was an education law that said kids are not permitted to bring pencils to school was called the pencil law. And every school board in the state was required to have a pencil budget. <coughs> you all understand why kids shouldn't bring pencils to school, right? Well, well, well the kids in the back of the room over here where Sam is and Jack, how do, how, and I'm trying to teach, and they got a pencil. They might be writing each other notes. Drawing pictures. I, I got no idea what they're doing with their pencil. And so, you, you can't let them have pencils while I'm trying to teach. I will give them the pencil when I want them to use them. And when I don't want them to use them, I'll take them away. <laughs> and every school district needs to have a pencil. And then another problem, if you let kids bring the pencils to school back then, some families were more affluent than others. Some kids' pencils had erasers on them. Other kids didn't. Do you know the disadvantage that would put the kid without the erasure on the pencil? So we had pencil uh, budget law. Until the Great Depression. And then in the Great Depression, what they concluded is 98% of the families had pencils. So why don't we let the kids bring the pencils to school? And why don't we let them uh, and teach them the responsible use of pencils? Do you let kids use these when they take the state test in North Carolina? No. How come? They might what? Cheat. How might they cheat? They look up the answer. What else might they do? Share with each other. They might either use resources or work with others. 
what are the two most basic skills the employers identify as the most critical for success in the 21st century workplace? <laughs> and what do you call it in your schools? I don't know if you can see it. I took this picture in a school. To every kid's name, they have to park their devices when they come in. Are they any different than 20, 20th century pencils? Well, I got a question. Are you expecting the schools to respond to the realities of a 21st century technological world? Or are you at making sure that technology conforms to your 20th century rules mm -hmm. and delivery system? It's a fundamental difference. When we watch and get inside these nations most rapidly improving schools, I got this group's point, uh, uh, observation about assessment was so accurate. Before they assess these kids differently. I thought this group's question about what does a teacher do, so appropriate. <coughs> they look different. The teacher is the facilitator. The classrooms don't look like our classrooms. They're action-based. The kids are totally engaged, involved, and the teacher is the coach, the facilitator on the side. And that is now going to exponentially increase because of the shift in technology. I already told you earlier that the number one player in instruction materials within three years in this country is clearly Google. They made it as their goal. I'm going to show you a piece of technology which at first blush to you, you'll say, what's it got to do with our classrooms? But I'll describe. In the baby's heart, I see it in 3D. I can see it from the front to the back. I can see it from the top, and I can see it from the bottom. costs $15.99. You'll get the box, and it's an app you put on your telephone, uh, uh, on your iPhone. And they have thousands of videos in there. And they're expanding them literally every day. And they're not only dealing with things they develop, they're dealing with people in the medical field and other areas. And all you, you can just, you look into it, and it's just like you just saw. Well, you know what they say at Google? Give us any science concept you're trying to teach, and we can take you inside the science experience for the kid. But here's my hunch. Google in three years, it's not going to be a cardboard. What do you think? It's going to be some form of simple glasses. Uh, you want to talk about a social studies event? You want to talk about World War II? Let's get inside the war. Let's let the kid experiment. Uh, CTE, you want to get inside a job? Let's go see the job. Let's explore it. 
middle school kids, you want to have them explore various kind of jobs, what the job is really like. You want to find out what it's like to be a uh, nurse in a surgical room, we'll put you inside one. The other issue, however, is this is not the only group. Uh, <coughs> mentioned, he said, our friend Ray, Ray McNulty. I don't know how many of you know Ray. Uh, Ray was my president. Uh, recently, he's the new dean and provost at the University of Southern New Hampshire. You've seen him advertise. They are now the largest uh, university in the world, just bypassed University of Phoenix. But they have both an on-campus that looks a beautiful campus like this and online, exploding in number. Uh, they uh, had a summit two weeks ago on Tuesday. I had the privilege of being there. Uh, Ray had the heads of three of the largest publishing companies in the country there. Head of Google, uh, head of three of the largest gaming companies in the United States. And why those companies combine? Because it's that combination of where instruction is going with gaming. Uh, and I don't like the word. I think we've got to come up with a different word because it communicates the wrong thing. But gaming, the gaming companies have paid more attention to brain research than the educators have. These games, are they engaging for the kids? Yes, yes. it is. Okay. Are they personalized? <laughs> different kids play different games. Now think about personalized in Google and the gaming companies merging their products and services. That's exactly what's happening out there in the marketplace. Um, who are they playing against? When they play the games, 2016, who are these kids playing against? Do you know? Themselves. 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 It, it has fundamentally shifted in the last couple of years. They're trying to beat what? Their last school. They are totally built on uh, growth concepts. And they have found that it's more exciting the kid to try to beat their last score than trying to play somebody they don't know. Really important. Every major gaming company out there are now being, building games built directly around the common core standards. in partnership with Google. Three-dimensional delivery. And the final group they're merging with is the online providers. How many in the room have ever taken an online course? Are they boring? A little or a lot? A lot. Suppose they're a game around a topic you like, built around the standards and three-dimensional. That is your instruction material three years from today. And there is literally hundreds of millions of dollars from the group I just identified developing them as we speak. <coughs> the only question is, are we going to bring it inside the system? or compete against us from the outside. Because I go back to this table's observation. They're, I think they are clearly, if your goal is simply to raise test scores, they're gonna clean your clock. Why, because what they have just done is extended the school day and school year because the kids love the games. If all you want are test scores, but I respectfully submit to you, if you ask for these rubrics and you see what these schools began to evaluate, it's a lot more than just test scores. Mm -hmm. It's about the personal development, it's about innovation, it's about creativity, it's about a whole series of other indicators, which is exactly what the business community is looking for in our graduates. <clears throat> and we're still back debating debates like this 1990. It scares me to death. By the way, the group I just identified said that they will recover their entire investment simply by contracts with the military. Sure. We do it all. Yeah. This is a no-brainer. 
and you are low-hanging fruit for them. <laughs> I think you need to have a policy in all this. You need to think it through. You need to get some people in your district who truly understand these items. Um, I think you're going to have to have some professional development around it, but I think you've got to go with the top third that want to try some things differently before it's mandated upon us. Go with the willing. Um, and look at hard data. Uh, I mentioned these WE surveys earlier. 540,000 kids. Now I'm going to give you one. This Troop County. And this is what caught the attention of the key executives in the story I told you at about 8.45 this morning. Um, we asked questions, a series of questions. This is the national data. This is their county data. And uh, when we do it, we give you both the national data and the county data, or your district data. And the reason we do that is this. Uh, if we don't put the national data up against it, I'll show you why in a second here, people think that your schools are totally screwed up. <laughs> and the answer is no more than the rest of the schools in the country. Okay? When you look at the data, 540,000 kids, and their immediate teachers. I'm not going to show you that. I'm going to go just to the summary data. Uh, we also have the community reaction to this about how relevant curriculum is, uh, uh, how much relationship they feel the educators actually have. So here's some data. Here's some summary data. This is natural. T stands for teacher, S for student. I'm expected to make students passing state tests my number one priority. Half the teachers said yes. But look what the kids thought. The kids think that's the purpose of your school. <laughs> because think about what we've told them. Think about what you're reporting on your report cards. This school has high expectations for all kids. 85% of the teachers say yes. 66%. That means a third of the kids feel that there are not high expectations. That's the bigotry of low expectations, folks. Students can apply what I'm teaching to their everyday lives. Look at the data. Again, over a half a million kids and their teachers. This is quad D. Teachers say it's happening. Kids say, I don't think so. Jack is right. It's relationships, it's relevance to get the rigor. Kids say, we really don't know. And so I'm, there's tons of questions. My suggestion is you want to get, <coughs> I don't care if it's our surveys, you need to do some surveying like this a couple times a year with your teachers. I suggest you do it at the end of about the first 10 weeks and near the end of the school year. Because you know what it does to your teachers? It puts them on notice that we're watching on these issues. Most of your teachers don't have to worry about whether the kids think anything is relevant, whether they get any relationship with them. It's not anything you value. It's nothing your data system reports out. You can disaggregate this down to individual teacher by building by district. So of all this, you're going to have to have, as I said, a boardroom to classroom um, approach, so I'm going to give you and close with a series of quick recommendations. First one is, you need to have every principal have a 20-day plan that comes to you. And what is the 20-day plan? How many of you were principals? See if this is correct. Most principals think a lot about the importance of improving instruction and want to do it but all week long are pretty busy and don't have much time to spend on it. And the first time they get a chance to think about it often is on the weekend where they might make a, a list of three or four things they want to do next week to get to it. And they show up Monday morning and all hell breaks loose. And they never get to it. The most important thing we should get to, the pressure of the day and the week prevents you from getting there. 
And so our advice when we watch these nations most rapidly improving schools, the superintendents were asking principals, and there's nothing magical about 20 days. It can be 30 days, it can be 15 days, but a relatively short time period of something specifically they were going to do in their building to try to get to quad B and D and, and make it simple. They need to give it to you, you need to list it, and you need to give it to your board of education. Because you know what it does? It then puts you on notice. At the end of the 20 days, you give the board back the next report. Column one is what I gave you 20 days ago. Column two is this is what we did. Now let me give you the plan for the next 20 days. You have got to move the improvement of instruction up on equal footing with everything else you're talking with the board about and everything your principals are talking to you about. The first thing I would put in those 20 day plans is about creating the culture. Culture trumps strategy. Culture trumps strategy. I think you've got to find a way to share some of the things we talked about today. So I'm going to give you the PowerPoint, the white papers. Find a way, and don't try to do it all in 20 days. Creating a culture is not an event. It's a systemic thing you bring in. And so maybe every, for the first four 20-day plans are all, only about culture of things you're going to do. Uh, maybe the uh, a principal is simply going to have a discussion with their APs in the first 20 days. Maybe the second 20 days is going to be a faculty meeting about you, you, you develop a plan, but it begins with creating a culture. Next thing is, Folks, you, you've got to analyze where your curriculum is. I'll show you in a moment some ways you can do that. You get it. Where are you? Are you in A and C? Or are you in B and D? We can provide you instrument materials. We can provide consultants into you to come in and actually look at or look yourself. Where is our curriculum? Is it in A and C, or is it in B and D? And if it's A and C, what are the next three or four steps you're going to take to begin to move it? And that becomes part of your 20-day plan. That's what these schools did. You've got to get the D. Measure what matters. If I looked at your report cards, what would they tell me? If I looked at your evaluation of your set, what would they tell me about what really matters? Is it the things we've talked about today? Is it things that lead to quad D? Is it about personal skill development or is it about the test? That's why I like the WE surveys uh, to do that. Professional learning. Uh, all teachers have got to teach reading. They don't know how to do it. Teachers have got to learn how to teach the quad D. Catherine talked about what they did in Central uh, Dolphin. What's your, what is your professional development plan to get there? And I want to raise a really critical question. We have found that North Carolina has a tendency to believe that you train all teachers on the same day for the same length of time. Ice performing schools are not doing that. Highest performing schools are making professional development much more voluntary rather than mandated. And you know who shows up? The top third. Middle third watch. The bottom third say over my dead body. When you only have the top third, do you have a lot more productive professional development day? Yeah. Yeah. What happens at six months later? The middle one third join. I think you're going to need some executive coaching of your principals and central administration staff. That's why Jack has asked Ed to figure out some ways to help some of you back in your local districts. We're going to try to immerse Ed into our schools, be that great experience in your schools, then to do some executive coaching. And the final recommendation I have to you is I'll bring a team to the Model Schools Conference. The announcement's on your table. Uh, 
let them see these schools. Let them see the Central Dolphins, the Brocktons, what they have done. And after the conference this summer, we'll run site visits into these school districts. Let your staff pick two or three of them that really look intriguing and go spend a day with them in another district that has done it. Let your teachers talk to teachers, principals talk to principals, superintendents talk to superintendents. Develop a mentor-mentee relationship with some of these schools if you want to change your system.